No matter who you are. Oh, shit. No matter what you want your life to be. You're gonna be a star. Tomorrow's another day. Now for a beer. Rolling like a VIP. I'm a little scared. Yeah. I'm a just smelly, growing man. I don't even know where to start. I think we're in trouble. That might be the best birthday present ever. Baby wipes, gold bar. If you can't figure out why, just think about it for a little bit. The sunsets, the dangerous animals, and the kind of wide open spaces that you can only find in Africa. These things have been the stuff of my dreams since I read about them in books when I was a kid and ever since I experienced them for the first time in person for myself. Africa is a mysterious place and it has an energy that is unexplainable. And that might be because humans, their ancestors, and those dangerous animals have coexisted here for over 5 million years. Nowadays, there are 54 countries in Africa, and in some parts of it, there are more humans than the animals and the land can sustain. But where I'm headed inside the country of Namibia, it's actually the exact opposite. Namibia has an average population of three people per square mile, but where I'm headed, it's more like one in 10 miles. And where the humans that do live here have ensured that the animals that are here are at the highest population numbers that they've been in generations. And it's that incredible story of conservation that brings me back to Namibia and reunited with an old friend. Nearly six years ago, I met Jamie Trout on my first ever trip to Africa. And it was through his eyes that I learned not only about Namibia's tumultuous and incredible history, but I also experienced a new style of hunting from a master. And it was through those hunting experiences that I learned about the ironic and delicate balance that hunters bring to the conservation of the many incredible animals that live here. I may have taken a handful of animals while I was there, but the memories I took home from that trip were the things I learned the things I saw, and the people I met. They call this the dark continent, but the last time I was here, all I saw was the shining light of happiness from the people that I crossed paths with. And to be honest, when I got home, I wanted more of it, all of it. And now I'm back to hunt with Jamie Trout safaris once more to learn about the oldest style of hunting for the largest antelope species in the world, a nearly 2,000 pound giant called Eland. It's my first day back in Africa in five years. Me and my good buddy Jamie are reunited and this is how I know it's the first day of safari. My legs look like chicken, chicken legs. Jamie's look like a, a, a grizzled pH, the grizzled pH that you are. I, yes, I mean, just, just beautiful. Look, I mean, just look at that. <laughs> Those are good Minnesota legs. That's what they are. My grandma would be proud of that. Those are good Norwegian legs. All hunting in Namibia is managed and regulated with hunter-driven conservation first and foremost in mind. Most of the public land in Namibia is divided into conservancies that are managed by local tribes. And the hunting is managed by a professional hunter whose entire education, career, and livelihood is centered around managing game. Jamie Trout is one of the most respected wild game PHs in all of Namibia. And that respect has earned Jamie Trout safaris the exclusive right to bring hunters into the Waterbird National Park, and this incredible place is where I'll be hunting. Waterberg sits on a table mountain plateau that rises above the plains of the Kalahari Desert and is largely inaccessible from beneath. Its natural inaccessibility and its national protection status, including extensive anti-poaching measures, make it home to one of the biggest population of endangered rhinos in the world. And of course, it's home to all sorts of other wild game which need to be managed, and that's why I'm here. But as we set out on our first morning of hunting, I'm very quickly reminded that we are stomping around in a very dangerous character's living room. So we just started on the Elan track and not too far along, Jamie looks down and says, that's a huge black rhino track, fresh. And then he loaded his gun. That's scary, that thing is huge. The reason we found that rhino track is that it was right next to a fresh Elan track that our tracker Elias found. And so begins my first true old school African tracking hunt. As we follow the tracks one by one, we run into all sorts of other wild game. And then all of a sudden like magic, and Eland appears out of nowhere. But it's day one and we are after all in search of fresh meat and Jamie says there's something a little off with this bull. Is that a shooter? So he's an old enough bull but there's something, something wrong, wrong with him, yeah. So 
Let's um, let's find a nice healthy looking boy here. Yeah. I know what you're thinking, cause I was thinking it too. I think I might grow to regret that decision. I'm in Namibia, Africa, on the Waterbird Plateau, looking for fresh tracks from an eland. The process is pretty simple. Walk and drive until you find a fresh track and set out to follow it. With the exception of the driving part, it's an ancient art that can find you following tracks for hours on end. And that's just fine by me because each track means a long walk through some amazing country and encountering some of the most majestic animals on the planet. And I'm talking about the kind of animals that most people only get to see in a zoo or in the movies. And that includes the ones that can kill you. As we're stalking for Eland, we've come across three white rhinos, which is all at once one of the most incredible things I've ever seen and also the scariest. I mean, they're 40 yards away. They know we're here and there's really no escape right now. Kind of a waiting game with one of the most endangered species on the planet. <sighs> Look at him marking his territory. Yeah. Seeing a rhino in the wild is nothing short of a dream come true for me. Poaching of these incredible animals because of the black market demand for their horns has brought rhino populations around the world to the brink of extinction. And if it weren't for places like Namibia, encounters like this and rhinos like this would be gone within our lifetime. There are two species of African rhino, the white rhino and the black rhino. And where we are in Waterberg Park has some of the highest populations of both in the world. While both have a reputation for being nasty, the black rhino is known to be the most aggressive of the two. And a few hours later, as the sun went down, I found out about that firsthand. Oh. <laughs> And he is not happy we're here. Okay, come this way, boy. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Hey! Come, come here. It's funny how when you get a bunch of grown men together, they all start acting tough because that laughing that you hear me doing is just covering up for the fact that I'm scared to death. Holy <laughs> What are you smiling about? About the rhino. <laughs> yeah, about the rhino. There are many things in Africa that I would like to experience over and over again, but this is definitely not one of them. That yeah, was fun. We spent the next few days walking, driving, searching, and glassing for Eland. It was definitely hard for me to see what my guide saw most of the time. There were so many old tracks everywhere that it was mind boggling for me the way they could see the fresh ones. And while we definitely had some encounters, we had no luck and I was starting to learn that this type of hunting is not a gimme and it is not easy. And then after four days of tracking and more tracking, things finally came together. We snuck up on a bull, got in the perfect position, and I was ready to take my safety off when Jamie whispered these words. He's not big enough. He's not big enough. My heart sank, but it also pounded, and it's a moment I'll never forget. That's the closest we've come. So close, he's just not big enough. Oh. Let's go get kneeling. Let's go get kneeling. Hey, 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 hey. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm in Namibia, Africa, hunting with legendary PH, Jamie Trout. And I'm hunting in an exclusive area that he and his partners are only allowed to take a small amount of clients into every year. I hunted with Jamie six years ago in a completely different part of Namibia. And now I'm starting to see that this time around, the location is not the only thing that's different. The hunting part is very different as well. I've been here a couple of days now. You know, the last time I was here with you, that was mainly spot and stock kind of hunting. Now, I'm starting to get this sense of what you call the traditional hunting. This thing that's completely foreign to me, the idea that we're gonna walk for five, seven, 10 miles, and then all of a sudden, poof, animals appear. It's, it's what we grew up with. Um, the way, you know, in the past, the way we did it was get up in the morning, go to a water hole or, or look at the, 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 the roads and see what tracks cross and you follow them. Um, 
Yes, there's also been Spartan stork hunting for certain species, but if you look at what we regard as, as let's call it premium species today in, right. in, in hunting, it, it, it's the, the elon, the buffalo, the elephant, um, and most of those species, no, all of those species, the traditional way is actually finding a track that's big enough that you yeah. know is a, is a big, potentially a big bull track and stay on it. I mean, that's the way it's been done for thousands of years here in Africa, right? Yeah, yeah that's the original hunting. Humans have been hunting since the beginning of humans. And ever since prehistoric times, hunters have used the ancient art of tracking to gather food. Tracking has been traditionally practiced by the majority of tribal people here in Africa for hundreds of thousands of years, especially in this part of Africa where the cover is thick and the animals can hide and escape easily. Even now in modern times, the traditional art of tracking is still the most successful way of hunting certain species in certain parts of Africa. And that includes the eland, which Jamie tells me weren't always in such plentiful of numbers. When I was a kid, eland numbers were just low. We had a tough time finding a permit. And if you did find a permit, it was a great day. As eland became part of the species that was traditionally sought after and a premium species for trophy hunters as well, people did not only see them as a, as a meat animal, they, they actually say, hey, I, maybe I should start conserving the eland that runs through my property occasionally and, and take care of them because they can be more than just meat in the pot. They can actually also provide some serious, you know, extra additional income. I'm convinced that because of that, we see more eland in, mo in not only distribution, but in numbers in, in, in a lot of places that the way they've disappeared, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Because hunters place value on them. Absolutely, absolutely. Or give them value. Yeah, give better. them value. You know, we have the saying, if the game plays, it stays, and that's very true for Elon as well. <laughs> It's a complicated thing to understand, but because of hunting in Namibia, there are more animals, not less. Hunters and ecotourists both bring in money that is directly connected to wild game. When a hunter takes an animal here in Namibia, the money from that hunt goes straight to local villages. It funds schools, hospitals, anti-poaching efforts, and nature preserves like this one. This gives the locals incentive to fight poaching and to conserve the animals that they coexist with. The bottom line is that when something has value, then people feel like it's worth protecting. And that conservation model in Namibia has brought elephants back to the plains, rhinos back from near extinction, and animals like the eland back to huntable numbers. Regardless of how traditional or how awesome all this is, the two of us just stink so bad that we need to take a shower. Just not, not together. We're not gonna take so a shower together. Yeah, yes. Yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've been hunting hard for seven days and I need to change things up. Sometimes I'm a little superstitious, so I decided I'm gonna go old school with this hat, which a buddy gave me. And then I realized that sitting in the woods over here is this. That's old school. This is old school, that's old school, they're old school. We're doing this thing old school. Sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures, and so I figured I might as well just drive as well. This door. And I think that the old truck gasoline fumes got to me right away. I can't remember the last time I drove on the wrong side of the car. As long as you stay on the right side of the road. Because there's so much traffic. It used to be an old ambulance. This was an ambulance. This used to be an ambulance, yeah. <laughs> then it was made into a safari vehicle. I call myself Minnesota Dundee. I'm not gonna lie, I've been on safari for seven days, and this is the most I've smiled <laughs> in all seven days. In 30 years, if you ever had a client ask to drive? Amazingly, it's mostly women. <laughs> women want to drive. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah they want to drive, yeah. yeah. So, so. so women and Nick. Obviously, if you ask to drive a vehicle like this, it just means you're adventurous. So you just basically called me an adventurous woman. Look, Mom, I'm driving an old safari truck in Africa in a stupid hat. Now you'd think between my lucky old hat and this lucky old truck and my apparent newfound adventurous side coming out that things were about to get lucky. And while we did strike up a fresh eland track right away, unfortunately the only thing it led to was another black rhino charge. But at least this time I had a tree to hide behind. So I guess at least that was lucky. We've got some action. <laughs> I 
I'd be lying if I said that after this many days that this hunt hadn't become tough mentally for me. We left camp on foot, and I gotta tell you that something felt different about today. And after an hour of tracking, my moment appeared 30 yards away. I was about to pull the trigger for the first time in eight days. Right over his back. I don't even know what to say. I have shot a lot of stuff over the years, but I've never had a 2,000 pound animal, basically a barn door off a set of sticks. 35 yards away, if that, and miss. I have no idea what that, what happened. I have no excuse. I, 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 I don't even know. All I know is I flew all the way across the ocean to Africa for that moment. I f***ed it up. Hunting, if you ask me, is a metaphor for life in a lot of ways, and at some point in life, failure is inevitable. And it's what you do with that failure that defines you. And when it happens to me, I always just try and say, tomorrow's another day. After nine days of doing this, I'm definitely in a routine. This is my first thing I do every morning. Coffee, warm up by the fire. It's cold at night here. It's like. 30 some degrees at night. I laid in bed all last night and thought about that miss yesterday. I have no idea what happened. And as kind of downtrodden and defeated as I feel about that, every morning there's something about a safari where you wake up and it feels like a brand new day, like you're a brand new person. And that's something you can only understand if you've ever been on a safari, if you've ever been somewhere like this in the middle of nowhere with nothing but a couple of friends and miles and miles of bloody Africa, as they say, all the way around you. I love this. Eland or not, this is my happy place. We head out in the truck to a vantage point that we've glassed from almost every day. But today was immediately different, because before long, Jamie noticed a group of bulls off in the distance. After five miles of walking, tracking, crawling, stalking, and glassing, we finally catch up to the bulls. Only there's one small problem. So we've tracked these bulls almost five miles. And of course they bedded in the thickest, nastiest stuff with no shot possible. There's five of them. We're 200 yards away, pinned down. Now it's just a waiting game. Patience was the plan that we all agreed on. And then a few minutes later, the three of us threw patience out the window. It was clear that this stalemate was gonna last all day and none of us wanted to do that. So we went for broke and started crawling through the bush and we somehow managed to get 40 yards away from a monster. Africa is believed to be the oldest inhabited place on Earth, and humans have been tracking and hunting these animals for hundreds of thousands of years through this same bush and this same sand that I walk in now. And at the risk of sounding trite, as I walk up on this giant animal, I'm struck by the feeling of connection to those ancient hunters. These last nine days have made me appreciate how hard it must have been to find food a thousand years ago. I'm a modern guy walking around with a modern rifle and we couldn't get close enough 99% of the time to even remotely get a shot with a rifle, let alone a bow or a dart. I'm not sure that I've ever worked harder or appreciated an animal more than I do this one. And the best part is that every bit of this meat is going to people that need it. And also, the back straps are going on my table tonight. It's hard to pin down just one takeaway from these past nine days in Namibia. But I think that one of the most moving things has been seeing firsthand hunter conservation dollars at work. The great Theodore Roosevelt was an avid African hunter who believed wholeheartedly in the power of the outdoorsmen to save the very animals that they kill. He said, 
The genuine sportsman is by all odds the most important factor in keeping the larger and more valuable wild creatures from total extermination. People like Jamie Trout are warriors to ensure that this is true. And he's showing me firsthand here in Namibia, hunter dollars have saved the eland and the rhino alike. And while my time here in Waterberg might be over, my time in Namibia is not. Tonight we eat fresh eland steak and celebrate the hunt, but tomorrow the sun will rise on my next African adventure.